Okay. So today we're going to continue our discussion of operator product expansions. And at this time, we're going to be talking about conformal field theories. I'll review to lecture 24 as usual. Whoops, there, this is lecture 25. There's a typo in here. Um, and I'll review it as usual. And if there are any questions along the way, just ask. Uh, whoops. OK. It's not what I wanted to do. Yeah, there we go. So over the broader expansion. It's a non-Lagrangian approach to quantum field theory. It consider a set of fundamental fields, fundamental local fields, right? He said that in quantum field theory, the notion of a particle is replaced, goes out of the picture, and what we deal with are EREPs of the Poincaré group. In R D comma one, they are labeled by mass and spin. So O I of X O is some fundamental field. X is a point in space time, and I is a label that carries the Poincaré uh, quantum numbers, uh, numbers, uh, charges, I guess. It's an operator value distribution. Example, some phi k of x, some scalar field. It could be a fermion. It could be a gauge field, right? All right. Consider free massless real scalar field in R3 comma one. The fundamental field is phi of x. The vacuum two point function could be written this way. There is an I epsilon prescription as usual. There is a class of regular states. These are states that we're gonna call Hadamard states and they're gonna be used in that formulation of quantum field theory. These are states that deep in the UV, as in when you take the two point function and push it all the way towards each, the, each other, they are given by the vacuum answer of free massless fields. We're gonna call these states Hadamard, right? There are corrections to it, of course, that depend on X1 minus X2, but the, the dominant singularity the dominant singularity is a singularity coming from vacuum of Rd comma one flat space. Quantum field, right? These are called Hadamard states. Now, what are the local operators of Lagrangian quantum field theory? What are the local uh, fields besides phi and derivatives of phi? There's phi two of x and phi k of x. We define these operators. These are composite operators. And they were, normal, they were def defined them using the particular normalization scheme. You could also have derivatives of them. You could have phi two bar k one, del k two, phi k three of x, such objects. Supposedly the goal is in an operator product expansion picture. What we want is a full list of such local operators. And we're going to try to, in a sense, make the list independent of each other, right? So we're going to make, we're going to create a list there. there we're going to define a notion of linear independence and we're going to have a complete list. The intuition is this, in a Hadamard state, if you have a phi x phi squared of y, Right? This phi squared of y is defined from the limit of the three-point function where x1 and x2 go to y. Now, of course, this limit is going to diverge, but we're going to subtract from this the uv divergences. Right? Not the, just the dominant one, any uv divergence that we expect. Right? So basically, a uh, proper renormalization scheme this way, this will allow you to define phi squared operator, right? This is a renormalization scheme that's called point splitting. And if you want to understand, if you want to get control over point, uh, renormalized operators using point splitting, what you need to do is you want to gain control over all singularities in the coincident limit. Any questions? Is this idea clear?
Now, why is this singularity structure useful? Well, imagine you have three point function, three operators, x1, x2, and y. Or sorry, no, no, sorry, x1, x2, and x3. But you do know that x1 and x2 are very, very close to each other. For all practical purposes, if they are so close to each other, you can, if you squint a little bit, you will see them as a local operator, right? So it's natural to say the inversion of these two operators could be approximated by a local operator. So this three-point function is actually could be understood as a sum of two-point functions with a bunch of coefficients. This is the basic idea behind operator product expansion, right? You squint a little bit and multiple operators that are very close to each other look like they're the same operator. This is this idea is also intimately tied to normalization, right? Is it clear why? This is course grading in sense. It's similar in spirit. Remember what was going on when uh, when we did a normalization group by integrating out Euclidean and momenta, there were higher point operators that were generated, right? So for example, if you had an interaction of this type, this type of interaction, the thing that was running in the loop was very, very heavy. This was very, very heavy. And you don't see, if you squint a little bit, well, squint here is like, if you ignore those guys, you will effectively see, uh, well, this is a bad example. Yeah, yeah this, this becomes a four point function. This is a normalization of four point function, but you'll see higher point functions, right? You'll see new interactions. This is the same thing, but in real space. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that this sum converges, right? It's asymptotic. The sum is asymptotic the same way that perturbation theory, quantum field theory is asymptotic. What does asymptotic mean? It can watch that this one in the diverge. Yes. Could diverge again. Could. Yeah. It doesn't have a limit. What 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 do you mean like could diverge? I think they could oscillate. Okay. My simple my yeah, not convergent doesn't mean divergent. Okay, next. But you're absolutely right. Often what happens past a certain point is that instead of it just like oscillating or something, it just actually grows and starts producing nonsense. So here's the structure. Here's our Hadamard state. These are a three-point function. And what you want is formally to say that if x and one, x two both go to y, this is basically sum over two-point functions. And these coefficients, well, I call them coefficients because of the terminology that comes from conformal field theory. These functions, they're functions, right? They're a function of x one and x two and y, and one, two, and k. K is the operator here, right? Are called the Operate the product expansion coefficients. More formally, we could just write the operate the product expansion. Yeah. Uh, that theta k that we have, that for example, uh, so what counts as a local operator there? So for example, does a, a O squared count as an operator? Does yes, if we, if, we def if we can define that, phi squared does, right? Phi, squ okay, phi, squared, phi squared does. Phi squared counts. Phi squared of k, phi squared of x, yes. It's a local, uh, yeah, here, here. I, I was saying this earlier, right? So here are a list of local operators, phi squared, phi k, okay. del k1, phi k, k2, phi k1, you know, like these guys. So all of these will come up in the upper part. Yes, absolutely. But the here is the point I'm trying to make. The Lagrangian formulation of quantum field theory gives you a bunch of basic fundamental fields and says all the other guys are generated using by taking derivatives and multiplying these guys. In operator product expansion, as a non-perturbative formulation, non-Lagrangian formulation, that need not be the case. You start with an assumption that there is a full list. Somebody gives you, hands you a full list of all local operators, right? And they're OPEs that defines for you a theory if the consistency conditions, the axioms we discussed are checked. Now, in this way of viewing quantum field theory, 
Lagrangians are a way of generating some quantum field theories, but not all quantum field theories need to be Lagrangian. Is that clear? Right, the way that we formulate C some CFDs, 2D CFDs that we do know exist, are not through these Lagrangians. We just literally come up with a list of these operators, their OPEs, and everything. So I guess the Lagrangians they used to come up with coefficients. If the theory could be constructed using Lagrangian formulation, yes, yes. Yeah, the coefficients and uh, the dimensions will be calculated in that way. Anomalous dimensions and all of that, right? Okay. So we said that we were going to abstractly think, write down these expressions. Right? These abstract expressions are really meaningful inside expectation, about, inside states. But we're going to call them abstractly as operator product expansion. They look like an algebra. It's not quite an algebra because these are not bounded operators. We're multiplying, right? It's not really multiplication. It looks like a multiplication because it's, that, that's associative, right? We even said that depending on the spin of this, your field, this might be commutative or not, right? Commutation relations or anti-commutation relations are important. If X1, sorry, let, let me clarify. If X1 and X2 are space-like separated, right? And if the um, fields are uh, integer spin, then this these commutes. If it's half integer, they do not, they anti-commute, right? So these are all the local fields. This is the two-point function. What, what I want to say is that the coefficient of, so if list of local operators always includes identity, right? That is spin zero, right? The coefficient of OP coefficient of identity is just a two-point function in the vacuum of rd comma one, rd minus one comma one, good? Now, this regular enough states, I also said a little bit more about it. I said that, okay, so formally, if you want to define it, it would be states that they look like this, the, the two-point function of the vacuum, there's a function here, there could be log divergences in four dimensions. Uh, yeah. And of course, this is a covariant, so this is the geodesic distance squared. Now, using point splitting, you could define all sorts of operators, right? Composite operators. And important, a very important composite operator is a stress tensor. That if you do have a Lagrangian formulation, you know exactly what it is, because it comes from another current associated with Poincaré transformations. But here in the point splitting or OP uh, picture, you take the OP of phi x1, phi x2, you take del del x1 mu del x2 mu nu from this, right? Now, you have to point, take the point splitting renormalization. This has divergences, right? You subtract all the divergent terms, the remaining finite piece, you're going to call that a composite operator, del phi, del nu phi, del nu phi. Similarly, you can define phi squared, which allows you to define stress tensor. Right? The first finite term on the right hand side of the OP is the very definition of the composite operator. But this really requires that you have an understanding of all the, the, the full structure, the singularity structure. Good. Of course, if you want to define phi n, you have to take the uh, OP of phi of x1 to phi of n. And anyway, this, this I, I said before, I don't need to go over it. All right, any questions? In the OP approach to quantum field theory, we went over all the axioms, but we have a bunch of fundamental fields that we're going to list, fundamental local uh, operative value distributions. We're going to list them 
and label them as O ones, O Ks, sorry, O Ks at point X. And then the other, the data that defines the theory are these OPs, CK of one to N, X one to XN of Y. We also have a dagger operation, right? From this OPE, the symbol set up is the OPE when you have two operators that you're bringing in, and then you're looking at the contribution of identity, right? The identity term and the OPE of O and O. So you're, you're saying O dagger of I of X, O dagger, O O of I of X1, X2 is one over X1 minus X2 to the appropriate power. Oh, actually, ah, sorry, my bad. <laughs> I just wrote this here. Um, this is going to look like C of I dagger, C of I dagger I, for the lack of better language, right? Of X1, X2, and Y identity plus da da da. Okay. Now, the scaling degree of this defines for you D of I or delta of I. You know what scaling degree means? It's one over x1 minus x2 to the power of two, this guy, D of I. This is the scaling degree, right? Then that expression that you wrote down at the bottom, yeah. actually x minus y to the power of two, D I. Would that be right? Yes, yes. Okay. Correct. Thank you. We also said that operator product expansion has this nice associativity feature. Meaning that when you have three operators, you could take the OP of this pair and then OP it with the other one or the other order. This associativity is the thing that we're gonna assume as a fundamental property. We're gonna actually try to use it. Well, I don't know, we're gonna run out of time today, but it's, it's people use these to restrict the space of all possible quantum field theories. These are called bootstrap equations. Yes, the results are, should be the same. We also talked about the flow equations for OP coefficients, right? So we, you could formulate, because it's a quantum field theory, you could formulate the normalization group and talk about the, how these OP coefficients change as a function, as you vary lambda couplings, right? Um, or mass, and then there are these relations that you find, which relate the OP coefficients to higher point OP coefficients and lower point OP coefficients. There's an infinite hierarchy of them. And we said that this, this at least on the surface of it, it looks like similar to Schrodinger Dyson equations from PFT1. Yeah. Uh, and this is to go back in the lecture a bit. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that these uh, OP summations, this summations are asymptotic. Yes. So when you're doing perturbation theory, yeah. we, we basically said that asymptotic, so you order the series in terms of the powers of the perturbative, the, the coupling, so to say. How do you order it for, the, for this OP? How do you order the terms? Distance. Powers of distance, right? The thing that we're ordering, we're, we're, we're expanding in powers of distance. So here, yeah, that's very good. This is, this is not the same thing as, uh, Perturbation theory asymptoticness. Perturbation theory asymptoticness, it was, we we're talking about the function being, expanding the function as a function of the coupling, right? Here we're expanding in terms of distance, real, real space distance, proper distance. There are examples, if I'm not mistaken, there are examples of theories where this is not asymptotic, but Perturbation theory. The, per, the, the standard perturbation theory, Feynman diagram perturbation theory is always 
asymptotic unless you're at really low dimensions, two dimensions. But there are higher dimensional examples of this that are non-asymptotic, that, that are convergent actually. To my knowledge, the first example I saw was proven like a couple of years ago, it's just like four or five years ago. Now this stuff is very new. This stuff is like the Lorentzian version of this was worked out about a year ago. But it's very, very hard, difficult. But I mean, it was established at a level that mathematicians like, right? So that's that's a high bar. All right, any questions? This is what we went over last lecture. Now, okay, I said that the OPEs relate the higher point function to lower point functions. So what do the OPEs say about the lowest point function? One point function, two point function, and three point functions. Consider free massive quantum field field, right? What is the one point function of phi of x? It's zero, right? You could see it explicitly by Fourier transform of this. It becomes phi of p. Phi of p is a p creation annihilation operator. That's zero. We said that this remains zero in the presence of interactions as well in lambda phi four, where all sorts of interaction, as long as the interaction term is a function of phi squared. The reason was a Z2 symmetry, right? Therefore, phi zero, phi of x, phi cube of x, all of that should be zero. But phi squared need not be zero. In particular, stress energy tensor need not be zero. The integral of it over the whole space is t zero zero integral over the whole space becomes Hamiltonian. That thing is zero. But energy density need not be zero at every point. There's no principle of quantum field state. As a matter of fact, you could prove that there are always states where this goes arbitrarily low. So let's try to just use OPEs in quantum field theory. Let's take the two point function in search of two operators. We're just going to take the OP and write it in terms of one point functions, right? So you instantly learn that in the, the OP coefficients between uh, like in, in this setup where K is phi cube, phi five, five, all of those are zero basically, right? Because this guy vanishes, goes away. By symmetry, so symmetries, restrict your operator product expansions. That's the whole punchline there. Symmetries, if you, you know, like when we're talking about Lagrangian, we said that we write down Lagrangians based on symmetries, localities, and things like that. So locality is inherently, is intrinsically built in the operator product expansion. The symmetries go into the structure of the OPE coefficients. All right. Any questions? In the remaining time, what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about conformal field theories. These are the UV fixed points. And uh, we are the goal is to describe how we could talk about what is the route that's led to discovery of a whole bunch of uh, conformal fixed points, scale invariant fixed points for quantum field theories that are fully well defined, that circumvents completely the Lagrangian formulation through the OP formulation. This, this. <laughs> we said a conformal transformation is a diffeomorphism that changes the metric by an overall factor function. So g mu of x goes to lambda of x mu of x. We use the uh, this to show that basically in D, okay, let's see, what, what notation do I want to use? I want to use Rd comma one. Let's stick with that. So in Rd comma one, hopefully I won't change my D. 
this is what's a, a conformal group here? S O D plus one comma two. S O D comma a plus one comma two. Yes. What is this guy? S O D plus three two. Right. This is Euclidean CFD. This is Lorentzian CFD. So, yeah. This is the Lorentz group. I think it's actually not a very good notation. Let me take this. 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 Okay. Yeah, I think this is a notation all sequence. All right, so what are the generators? What are the transformations? You have translations, you have dilations, you have rotations, special conformal transformations, which are to be understood as inversion, translation, inversion. And here, rotations and translations change the metric by one, because there are isometries. Well, I say rotation. These are Lorentz transformations, right? Um, the special conformal transformation changes the metric this way. How does the dilation change the metric? Alpha squared. Good. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Ha ha. Yes. <laughs> I guess it correctly. So now it's conformal field theory. So there will be nodal currents in RD. Uh, my bad. Nodal charges. I'm talking charges now. Oops. And RD minus RD minus one comma one or S O D comma two, the Lie algebra, right? So P mu is just I del mu dilation is minus I X mu del mu, L mu nu is the covariant, you know, the the, the rotation and uh, Minkowski space, you know what I mean, right? And then K mu is the special conformal transformation. Good. One thing to notice is that if you set x mu equals zero, except for p mu, all these guys vanish. All right, so let's make a separation here. So what's the Lie algebra? The Lie algebra is as follows. Here's the Poincaré, which is S O D minus one comma one. Sorry, here's the Lorentz, S O D minus one comma one. Right? This is the Lorentz of this. Then you have the Poincaré part, the commutator of P's translations and Lorentz transformations. What is important to notice, now I want to draw this slide, is to be compared to the representation theory Lie algebra that I was describing to you guys, the carton and all of that two lectures ago. What's important here is that this P and L mu on the right-hand side is written in terms of P. What does that, what's that analogous to? So think of L mu as H and P mu as A or A dagger, creation and relation operators, or generalization thereof. Same thing for K rho. Actually, P, P acts like a set of creation operators and K acts as a set of annihilation operators. We'll see that. D and L mu nu commute. So it's, we can pick L mu nu and D as an abelian subgroup, a carton, right? Diagonalize everything in this basis. Then look at these relations. These relations make it very clear that P mu is a raising operator, then K mu are lowering operators, right? 
these guys, with respect to this carton, form a representation theory of your uh, your Lie algebra. Now, if you recall, it was, there was one last relation, which was the commutator of the raising and lowering operators. You should be able to write it in terms of the uh, carton generators. Here it is. So what we're gonna do is based on the representation here of uh, uh, Lie algebras, semi-simple Lie algebras, we're gonna pick Lorentz transformation L mu nu or rotation the Euclidean CFT, right? And scaling and simultaneously diagonalize them, right? So we're gonna look at this, they're eigen operators. What are what is the eigenvalue of d called scaling? Scaling dimension. Right? Now for L mu nu, the eigenoperators are organized this is rotation in terms of spin. Right? So spin and scaling dimension are going to be our quantum numbers. This is to be compared to Poincare group where m squared and spin were our quantum numbers. Right? Are we good? Okay, conformal primary fields. All local fields are defined at the point. We want to now classify the set of all local operators at the point. Operator value distributions. I won't say that. I just call it operator. Fields. By translation symmetry, I can just move this around. So let's just do that at x equals zero. Why x equals zero? Because those those guys so vanish. It's easy. Good. So there will be scaling operators. Right? These are operators that the commutator with D would be some scaling dimension. You could use a conformal algebra to calculate the, con assume this is correct. Then you can calculate the commutator of D and P mu of O. You find that is delta plus one P mu of that. So indeed, this is a raising operator. Similarly, K mu is a lowering operator. Now, if you remember from representation theory, of Lie algebras, we're interested in the lowest weight, right? These are ones that are in the, in the language of harmonic oscillator, these were the state, the vacuum was killed by all the A's, right? Here, we're interested in operators that the commutator with K vanishes. If you have an operator whose commutator with K mu, special conformal transformation vanishes, it's an eigen operator of dilatation and an eigen operator of Lorentz transformation rotation. Such a thing, we call it a conformal primary field. Good. Once we have a conformal primary field, because these are raising operators, we keep applying raising operators and generate new conformal uh, scaling fields, right? Because we saw that these remains eigenoperators of scaling operators. And spin. How does the spin, what's the spin of this? It's N plus the spin of O. But if I pick two of these guys and contract them, Right? If I if, if I pick what's the spin of this? So imagine phi is dimension left, is, is has dimension delta and spin zero as equal zero. Right? What is this guy? This is delta plus one and s equal one. Right? Spin goes up and delta goes up. Spin goes up because it's pre obvious. It's, the spin goes up. But what if I do this 
possibility change from five. But the, the scaling goes up. What is important is the following. So you're not guaranteed. But when you keep applying these operators, you're not guaranteed that you, if the result, if the resulting operator exists, right? If it's not true and exists, then it will have to have these dimensions. But if you are in a massless scalar field, massless free scalar field, del mu del mu of phi is zero. That's the equation of motion, right? That just says that this operator is null. It has zero norm, right? You just discard it. So the rule of equations of motion is becoming a little bit clearer here. So to clarify that, I'm gonna, if this formulation is a little bit abstract, I'm gonna try to work out the, precisely the example of massless free complex scalar field. Every time you deal with CFDs, operating product expansion, this is the example I want you guys to keep in mind. If there is one thing I want you to remember is this. The complex, so here's the action, Lagrangian density. Phi zero is a primary of what scaling dimension? D minus two over two. This was a naive dimension counting, but it's also a conformal field theory. So it's an exact dimension. Count. There are no interactions, there's no normalization, anything. K mu of phi is mu, zero is zero. L mu nu of phi is zero is also zero. It's actually a conformal primary. Here's the scaling dimension. Um, sorry, wait a second. Um, I said something incorrect here. D is larger than two. That's important. And D equal two, well, everything I'm saying, and D equal two gets a little bit more complicated. Can you guess why? What happened? What goes wrong with? Yeah. What 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 goes wrong? There was a two point function of five. What's this? Why is it not a scaling dimension? Because like x minus y is about two delta. So delta is zero then. What's the two point function? Log. So in the, that's why in the Hadamard state that included the log. Right. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated. Two dimensions. So in two dimensions, what's the primary conformal field? Yeah, I guess. Okay, yeah, so this is scaling operator of dimension one, right? This two point functions are good. It's actually a conformal primary. It's killed by K and all that. All right, but I'm not talking two dimensions. Okay, I'm talking higher dimensions. So, we get the descendants, del mu one to del mu n of phi zero. These are descendants. And what's their dimension? Is d minus two over two plus n. Good. Now, I'm gonna talk about conserved currents and null states. Phi is, has dimension d minus two over two, s equals zero. Del squared of phi or p squared acting on phi is zero by equations of motion. That means that this is a null state. We also had a current, the number of uh, particles minus antiparticles, right? It was this was the current, del mu of phi star. Do you remember what this was? This was. A that what did we call it? We call it D dagger D plus B dagger B minus B dagger B. D and B are equation and uh, annihilation operators for sorry, annihilation operators for particle and antiparticle. What's the dimension of J mu? Look, let's look at this operator. This is D minus two because there are two factors of phi. 
plus one, d minus one. Remember I told you that currents have dimension d minus one? This d minus one, del mu of j mu is zero. This is another null state. Is there any relation between car conserved currents and operate dimension and spin of operators? That's what I'm trying to get to. Let's see if there is. A conformal primary that has dimension d minus two plus s as positive integer and spin s must be a conserved current and vice versa. There's a theorem, we could prove this. And the conservation law tells you that there is this null state. This is a conservation law, but there's a null state. Uh, I should write it this way. Example, s equal one is j mu. S equal to T mu nu. That's stress tensor. For S larger than two, these are called in the theory of massless uh, spin, uh, free, free uh, complex scalar or O-N model. They're called higher spin currents. Yeah. Are these the only like, uh, examples? J or the other best Sorry, these are so J mu in in a theory that is O N model, massless O N model, right? Uh, or say say complex scaling field. J mu is this operator, and it is an example of. Uh, well, it's one, one such example. But if you abstractly have a CFD and you know that there is an operator in your spectrum that has dimension delta d minus two plus s and spin s, there must be a conservation law. Right? Does that answer your question? That's the point. So an operator of dimension d and spin two is the stress sensor. It's conserved. What is the what is the spin and dimension of identity as an operator? Spin zero. It has to be zero. Yeah. Why is that? Because what is the how does the conformal transformation act on it? It's a unit here on the left, unit here on the right. U U dagger is one, right? So it's invariant. A question for you guys. Could the scaling dimension be negative? What goes wrong if the scaling dimension is negative? The answer is it cannot be something horrible happens, but all right. Unitarity is violated. So in a CFD, because we constructed all the descendants in terms of primaries, all I need to give you is the OP of primaries. And the CFD logic is like this. You list all the primaries, all the other local fields are descendants. That's it. Right? Because conformal group has to, these, they have to act on it, right? So because they were labeled by, uh, so the primaries are labeled by delta and S. So I'm just, using A as uh, spin indices, representations of SOD or D minus one comma one, depending on Euclidean versus Lorentzian. Um, IJ, here's the operator product expansion. 
Okay, this is just what you would write, copy pasting what we wrote over there. Del Y. Del Y. Ah, why? Why is that? Can someone answer? So here what you put is arbitrary uh, arbitrary local operators. I said, I'm going to restrict these guys to be conformal primaries because all the descendants are just derivatives. But if you have two local primaries, here descendants can appear. So yes, I can get rid of this, right? At the cost of just summing over all of these guys. But you can repackage that all together as a differential operator because it's all fixed by conformal symmetry, by kinematics. That's a very good question. All right, so now let's go back to our story of uh, one-point function, two-point function, three-point functions, because OP is supposed to reduce the relate different point functions. So what are the one-point functions uh, in a CFT? In the vacuum, it's zero, except for identity. All the scaling operators have zero. Why? The only other example, yeah, thoughts. The only other piece of intuition that you have that would be used to show that the one point function, some one point functions for interacting theories vanish was using symmetry. This is a like fully non perturbative statement. Right? I'm not within any perturbation theory or anything. I'm just saying one point function is zero, period. Must follow from symmetry. The same way that we argued that phi, one point function of phi x in any theory that's z2 invariant must be zero. So what symmetry is that? Correct. That's right. Scale invariance and translation invariance will kill it. We'll, we'll argue that it's zero. All right, so the two point function. Now we're going to focus on scalar primaries uh, for simplicity. Spin is always, it's just representation theory. You can do it. But in your homework, you will show that the two point function of two primaries. Two scalar primaries can always be written this way: Cij x one minus x two delta one plus delta two. This means that this structure allows us to diagonalize this matrix and think of orthonormality, right? If we diagonalize it, it means that we will redefine local fields such that Oi. O I O J is basically proportional to delta I J, right? Sorry, no, that, that's incorrect. It's non-vanishing only if the dimensions match. There could be several operators of the same dimension, right? There can always be several. What was an example of that? You saw examples of that for it. All right, I'll let you guys think about that. You've seen examples of that. We discussed that in detail. All right, there can be several operators in the same dimension, right? But if you put that aside, but by the way, what when does that happen? Just physically, some symmetry. There's gotta be, if you have an operator that has degeneracies, it's going to be symmetries. Why? Because arbitrarily small perturbation to a matrix will lift all the degenerates. This is a piece of intuition keep with you forever. If you have matrix, you're diagonalizing it, the self adjoint or whatever, it's Hamiltonian. It's, if you see degeneracies, there must be some fine tuning because arbitrarily small terms will just lift all the degeneracies. That just means that it's going to be a symmetry of your time. 
some something must be forbidden. If some if two two numbers that are two real numbers are the same, <laughs> it must be forbidden for them to not be the same. That, that's just the way I say it. Because <laughs> these are not integers. These are right, these are real numbers. Okay. Enough philosophy. Is the notion of orthonormality here clear? Or do I need to explain that? I'm hiding a lot behind the, I'm pushing a lot under the carpet, but hiding a lot because this is a whole course. But I want you guys to have seen the basics of it. And just like work out a bunch of examples so that we don't just like uh, freak out if you see a talk when they say oh, operating product expansion or something. All right. In your homework, you also show that it follows from the conformal symmetry that the three point function of conformal primaries takes this form. X i j is x one minus so this is a common notation. X i j is x i minus x j. It's just a different notation, right? So what does it say? It says that the one point function, two point function, one point function of conformal field theory is fixed by symmetry. Two point function of field uh, field theory is also fixed up to these. Coefficients, CII. Three-point functions are also fixed up to coefficients. Here, there is no space. Space dependence is also fixed. So we're going to see in a second that when we go from QFD to CFDs, those operator product expansion functions become honest coefficients because their dependence on X1 and X2 will become fixed by the algebra. That's why all along I've been calling them coefficients where they were clearly functions, right? Because the historical convention was that it was this was invented in CFDs and these were coefficients that people have been calling them coefficients. And by analogy, operated by their functions, I guess, have been called coefficients. So now something amazing happens. In a CF, in quantum field theory, I told you that the non perturbative definition of the quantum field theory were these long list of functions, right? Here, in the case of CFDs, these are just numbers. You just give me a list of numbers and you define for me a theory. If, if the, I satisfy all the uh, axioms, in particular, the hardest ones to satisfy is going to be crossing associativity. That's why people use associativity to put bounds on the space of possible CFDs. This is called bootstrap. These are just numbers, right? These are, you can run them as like a uh, convex optimization uh, algorithm. We just solve them. So what does this tell you? How does this actually teach you something about uh, CFDs? Well, look at this. If you do the operator product expansion of these two points, you get this expression. Now you have a sum over two point functions. Two point functions you have already diagonalized. So you learn that this, the left hand side, so there's a bunch of coefficients here. The left hand side and the right hand side should be the same. The left hand side here, OL and OK will give you delta of LK because you have diagonalized them. So you just learn that this function. The functionality of it is fixed. Just is fixed up to coefficient. So said differently, when we wrote down the operator product expansion of quantum field theory, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to write this as f. These are a bunch of numbers multiplied by a bunch of functions that are known differential operators and all dimensions. You could explicitly write them, you can look up, look them up in different CFT books. So what defines are these, the theory are these numbers. 
Any questions? Now, here is where the magic happens in CFTs. The two-point function and three-point functions determine the conformal data of the CFT. The conformal data is a list of SIs and delta Is, right? Local operators. You organize them in terms of scaling dimensions and spin. It's a list. And then a bunch of FIJKs, right? These are the OP coefficients. This is the conformal data. And all of that is fixed in terms of one point function, two point function, and three point functions. Here's the magic. In CFDs, operating power expansion is convergent. You could prove that. Which means that you could just repeatedly insert these sums inside correlation functions. And because you calculate three point functions, you could insert inside a four point function. Inserting this inside a four point function brings it down to three point function. You have already solved three point function, you get the answer. You do this rec rec recursively solve for all the higher point functions, and these are all convergence. That's what's magical about CFDs, right? Now, in QFD, people don't really do this all that much because these are asymptotic sums, right? You don't really have no, you have no control. Unless if you get lucky and we can prove some quantum field theory is expansion is actually convergent. Now, I have to say that even though the belief is that quantum field theory OP is asymptotic, there are there have been a few surprises along the way. In the past couple of years, there were a couple of important theories that people discovered that their OPEs were actually convergent, even though for a long time, people would have thought that it would be um, asymptotic. <clears throat> so how do you use the OP to calculate the four-point function? For, the answer is intelligently. First thing, x1, x2, x3, x4. There are four functions. Four points, right? You realize that using translation, scaling, dilatation, uh, uh, conformal, special conformal transformation, the conformal group, you can always fix, you can use translation, you can always put one of them to one, zero. Using scaling, you can bring another one to one, you can special conformal transformation and bring the other one to infinity. And then there is one that's not fixed. And that is at some point that I'm going to call ZZ bar. Now, what is ZZ bar? U is this combination of X1, X2, X3, X4. V is this combination. And U and V are the only things that matter. You can view them as a two-dimensional space. Think of it as a complex variable Z. And this is the ZZ bar thing. This is the way they're related. This is called cross ratio. These are called conformal cross ratios. The only conformal invariant content of this is just Z, ZZ bar. U and V are the only conformal invariant that, that there is a function. Let's pause this, pause here because this calculation is this conformal cross ratio. How many of you guys have seen conformal cross ratio before? It's all over the place in physics, even if you're not dealing with, because conformal symmetry is all over the place. Um, yeah, it's very important. Using the conformal group, you can always fix three points to be wherever you want, but not four. Four points you cannot, right? One of them you can put on zero, the other one, and it's conventional to put one of them on zero, one, and infinity, and then the other one somewhere. Now, when you have this setup, you could do the OP of these two guys, and these two guys, and then the two-point function. Yeah. So, so they're like 16 different columns. So, I mean, say, say it again, say it again. So, if I'm understanding correctly, the reason you cannot fix all the point one is to specific locations of the 16 coordinates in the 16 coordinates? Ah, in four dimensions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But this is not a, uh, no, this is not a, uh, 
uh, four dimensional result. This is just true in all dimensions. Mm -hmm. This is always true. But I mean, the, the easiest way to think about it is like this. Uh, first, use translation to bring one of them as zero, right? Then use scaling. So now you have to use the subgroup that preserves that zero because you don't want to mess up with it. What's that? Another generator of that subgroup is dilatation. Dilatation can let bring help you bring one to one, right? Now you want to look at which part of the conformal group will preserve zero and one, will fix two points. You find that subgroup is one dimensional and can push the point to infinity or wherever you want it. Just like, as a matter of fact, it's sort of um, once you've brought, yeah, in arbitrary dimensions, it's always two dimensional because there's like rotations. It's just like this 2D plane, the rest of conformal symmetry just takes this plane and rotates it. It's just no good. It, it, it doesn't help. But it's not buying anything. The fact that in higher dimensions, you have larger symmetry, it just will always allow you to focus on a 2D slice of it. It's a good exercise. I think conformal cross ratios, if you haven't played with them, you absolutely should. Now, finally, here's the last slide that I have about crossing or associativity. If you have a four-point function, you could contract them. You could do the OP of, oops, these two guys to get a one point here, these two guys to get a one point, and an O in the middle, or do it this way. When you do it this way, here, you're going to get a sum over. I'm just going to be a schematic, right? Um, o, uh, that's a bad one. Sorry. Here, you're going to get a sum over OJs, right? And then when you bring them together, there will be a sum because there will be delta IJ. You will be left with one sum. Right? That labels this guy in the middle. The sum, the sum, and the, the term inside the sum that corresponds to a particular primary has a name. It's called conformal block. Right? So it's a, is, it, is it clear what it is? Sorry? Yeah, so. So O1 and O2, I write it as the sum over K, C, K, 1, 2. I'm going to be schematic. Okay. Right? And then here, I'm going to write it. So this is a, this part. And here, I'm going to write it as O3, O4, sum over L, O, L, C3, 4, L. Next, I have to look at this term. So when I put them together, but these two guys will give me delta of KL. So I'm going to end up with sum over K, C12K, C34K, right? OK, OK. Right, whatever that is, it's a two point function. This, this term. It's called a conformal block. The coefficient, the x-dependent part of it is called conformal block. Right? It has to do, usually people draw it this way. You write that O. That means that here is O. It's a sum over all the intermediate things. This you can think of as a projection. This you can think of as OK, OK. So the conformal block just projects to a particular operator in the middle. These conformal blocks are written this way, Gs. They're actually known, they're functions of four 
external uh, dimensions for external spins, an internal spin and delta, and then CI, uh, the, the OP coefficients are out there. They're known functions. These are known explicitly, actually. Well, in, in two dimensions and four dimensions, uh, oh God, I'm gonna get this wrong. In, in, in three and five, they are known explicitly, like closed form. In two and four, they are uh, known recursively. But they're fixed by the algebra completely. So all that remains is when you're solving the crossing equation is the sum over OP coefficients, right? Some known function, sum over OP coefficients, other OP coefficients, some known functions. Now and you could write these, uh, you could solve these as uh, like on a, on a computer using, um, can't talk. Semi-definite uh, program. Uh, these are called bootstrap equations, and people have used them to find, to restrict, to limit the space of conformal field theories. Yes. Bootstrapping means this. It means that let's take, for example, assume we have a theory that has a scalar primary of dimension delta, right? Now we're gonna take the four point function of that guy. And then we're gonna assume there is another arbitrary primary scalar probability in this spectrum. We show that the OP coefficients of that arbitrary of that primary has to be in a particular regime. If it's lower than a certain amount, it will definitely violate these equations. We cannot make it a one primary kind of regular starter. Um no see these equations will this is a conformal data, right? But it's not like you can obviously pick them to be whatever and you can always solve these equations. Right? There are constraints. Bootstrap is an intelligent way of exploring those constraints, right? These data, it goes in there and they have to satisfy the left has to be equal to right. Now, that is an infinite set of constraints. It's actually unknown whether, uh, so the examples of quantum field theories that we have that are called rational conformal field theories, these are models where the list of these primaries is finite. So there is a set of constraints are finite. You could check, they're all good. We're all good. It's not known whether there are no explicit examples of irrational conformal field theories No, These are theories where we know that there's an infinite list that satisfies these equations. As a matter of fact, the solution to the infinite set of equations, the infinite set of equations is unknown mathematically whether they have any solution. It's not known whether there are any solutions that are not rational to these equations. Rational means that there are, you actually have infinite set of independent equalities. If it's finite, it's a different game. All right, unfortunately, uh, because this is QFT and not a CFT course, I'm not gonna do justice to this, but I just wanted you guys to have seen CFDs, Operator Product Expansion. It's a formulation of quantum field theory that's becoming more and more dominant. Almost, at least in my subfield or like high energy theory or condensed matter, you pretty oft, often you hear Operator Product Expansion. Even in condensed matter these days, CFDs is all about the movies. So a lot I haven't discussed. Two-dimensional CFTs, they have an infinite dimensional group. The group is not SO2, two, it's infinite dimensional. And that's there's a homework problem about that. So there's a last homework set, problem set, problem set eight that I already posted. I know that I posted things a little bit late. Sorry, sorry about that. They're all due May 4th. So you have three weeks or so, four weeks to 
solve them all. And uh, uh, just to make sure that you guys do a good job of those problems, because that's what your grade is going to be based on. For the remaining uh, couple of lectures, I will not assign homework, but I, in return, I expect you guys to do a solid job of the other homework. Because I cut down a number of problems, but they're all conceptual problems. So give them like good thinking, right? So, um, okay, any questions? Yeah. Okay, why is one on the left, like one and two, and on the right, three and four, like being used for the exponent? In the denominator. In the denominator. Here. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's usually that has to do with the way with the, the convention that is used to define conformal blocks. So that usually when you define conform, so the, the dependence of the conform blocks on the external legs is all fixed by algebra. So depend it's it's been proved shown to be. Uh, so it's nice to, if you want to solve the these equation, it's nice to pull out the z to the power of delta 1 plus delta 2 from the left, 1 minus z to that power from the right. The reason is the following. If you try to numerically solve these equations to find bounds, you want to solve this around z equal half. And that is the base way of like normalizing things. You, could, you don't have to normalize things that way, but that's a standard convention. Is it is it clear what I'm saying? Okay. Um, well, if here here's my suggestion: write down explicitly the open in terms of the OP equation. You will see it. Any other questions? This equation value in two dimensional space time. So oh, the, the, yeah, it is, it is. So, sorry, let, let me let me try again. On this side, on the left, you're writing the operator for the function for one and two. That will give you z to the power of delta one plus delta two, right? But not quiet because there will be minus delta o in there. Is it? So in operator for the expansion, yeah, I think you have to just write this down explicitly to see. The structure is like this, O1, O2, with sum over K, right? Um, so let's say O1 of X1, O2 of X2, it's gonna look like one over X1, two, to a power of delta one plus delta two minus delta K, OK. Just by conformal by dimension counting, right? That's what it has to be, right? So that when when I wrote the very first term contribution, I didn't think that's what it was. So it's conventional to take because on the left you're doing the OP of one two first. It's conventional to take z to have z is like this x one two kind of like right. You take delta one and delta two from this point, not this term. This term is usually eaten inside the conformal block. On the other side, you're expanding around one minus z. Is that clear why? So let me let me explain this. Here are your four points. One z infinity. This is z, right? Z is one. You do this one first, so your distance is z. And the second one, you're doing this guy. So it's one minus z is your distance. But again, you eat delta k inside the conform block. That's convention. Any questions? By the way, when I say that these OPs are convergent, what does it mean? It means this. Uh, actually, this is, a, this is a good picture here. It means this. It means that if I have two operators, so in conformal field theory, as opposed to QFT, in QFT, I said the two points should have to go towards each other. When I had three point functions in QFT, I said the distance between these two will have to be much smaller than that distance. In CFT, smaller, larger don't make much sense, right? So things actually have to be convergent precisely for that reason. You're allowed to do an OPE as long as 
in any disk, any sphere you can draw, right? You can write that whole piece. So here's x1, here's x2, and then you're going to write the terms of operators y, y. As long as you can write now find a sphere where there's no other operating insertion, you're allowed to do that. Right? So here's a tricky thing. When I have this, let's say z is very close to one, uh, very close to zero. So I'm just going to pick this and write it in terms around zero. Right? If z, and then for, for if I want to expand around these two guys, I cannot pick this guy. Because there's this is inside it, I'll have to do it this way, right? <laughs> but you know, if you ever find yourself stuck, you do control transformation, move things around because the distance is meaningless, right? That's why these are so powerful in quantum field theory. That's precisely what kills you, right? Because these relations really hold asymptotically. Something has to be much smaller than the other one. So what is much smaller? How much can you trust these equations? Like how well can you trust your calculation approximations? Anyway, so here's the story of today. So we are gonna close this, like, this discussion of operator product expansion. And um, I just wanted you guys, I know it was too quick. I know it was very rushed, but I wanted you guys to have seen operator product expansion because it, Big, it's like a dominant way that we, almost dominant way that we think about quantum field theory these days, modern understanding of field theory. In the remainder of the semester, where next lectures, two lectures are going to be about instantons, but you don't need to worry much about them. What we're going to discuss is two-dimensional gauge theory and three-dimensional gauge theory. Topic we haven't discussed, and you're going to find all sorts of subtleties in quantization. They're going to be related to instant hot. And if we have time, we're going to talk about large end. If not, we'll skip it. All right. Any last questions? If you